Now, as you know, last week we made quite, we were quite interested, as we have been ever since our inception on the platform, we are quite interested in the issue of freedom of speech and the idea that robust debate and the airing of diverse points of views is vital to democracy, to the civilization that we all live in. And that we believe, that we believe <laughs> preserving freedom of speech and preserving the right to say things, even if they offend other people, is very, very important. And I think part of the issue we've been talking about today with the fall from grace, apparently, according to polls of this government, is this government's, well, lack of enthusiasm for free speech. As evidenced by its desire and its intent, stated intent, to create uh, new hate speech laws uh, before the next election. And the publication last week of an amazing booklet from the Security Intelligence Service, which was a sort of every person's guide, 50 pointers to look for violent extremists. And the publication uh, last week on Television New Zealand on Tuesday of a documentary called Web of Chaos, in which a government-aligned academic suggested that watching Pinterest clips on knitting, home renovation and pictures of girls with braided hair was a precursor to being brainwashed by Nazis or white supremacists. Of course, most of New Zealand reacted with, well, I think uh, bemusement and in some cases humour or mirth uh, to what was promulgated last week. But I and I think some other people think it's much more serious than that. And one of them is a person I would normally uh, associate with a Labour government and to be supportive of it. His name's Chris Trotter. Many of people over maybe 30 or 40, no, over 40, 45, will remember Chris Trotter. Um, he's still one of the most experienced political commentators in this country. Uh, but because he's not quite woke enough, you won't have heard as much of him as you should in recent years. We do publish uh, his Bow Welly uh, blog columns occasionally on the platform because mostly they're pretty good. And I was surprised to have a conversation with Chris last week about the SIS Dob in Your Neighbour handbook and find that in many uh, ways we were completely in agreement with it. So I thought I'd get him on the program today to talk about this wider issue of freedom of speech and what appears to be this government's propensity or disregard for it. Now, Chris, welcome to the program. Lovely to be talking with you. It's good to be with you, Sean. Yeah. So what did you make? Could you believe it when the SIS, when Rebecca Kitteridge at an open conf uh, conference, the head of our spy agency, came out with this booklet, How to Spot, you know, a Violent Extremist? Well, <clears throat> I was reminded of the comment from... American satirist Tom Lehrer many, many years ago. You have to be fairly ancient to remember Tom Lehrer's songs, but he was brilliant at... Uh, at satirical anti-Vietnam war strongs, is that right? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he tackled, you know, a, a broad range of things. Um, New Math was one of his most famous, which is hilarious if you ever get a chance to listen to it. Um, but he gave up writing satire, he said, um, when um, uh, Henry Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, I, 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 I can't, I can't top that. with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, I was reminded of, of, of Tom Lehrer when, when the SIS brought out this Know the Science uh, document. I suspect they brought it out on demand uh, because there is as you alluded to just a few minutes ago, a growing, I don't know quite what you'd call it, mania, uh, perhaps, That's in madness. this government. Uh, yeah, madness, probably a wee bit strong, but, but I'm, 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 I'm certainly, you know, thinking along those lines because it seems uh, irrational, it seems... Uh, without any kind of sensible location in reality, 
Um, but this whole misinformation, disinformation mania uh, on the part of the government has just acquired tremendous um, momentum. Uh, and I suspect that Rebecca Kitteridge was, um, in inverted commas, encouraged uh, to produce this document. Um, I was staggered on the whole range of, of fronts, I must say, by this document. But one of the things that really alarmed me was why, if you believe that the country is brimful of Nazis and white supremacists. Why would you release a document which alerts them to all of the behavioral tells <laughs> so that are suddenly likely to all the Nazis their intent? are going to be going around dyeing their, red, their redhead kids' daughters hair some other colour and taking out the braids. I see what you're saying. The knitting circles yeah. will be collapsing. You know, if you're... Yeah. If you're... Everyone will be logging off person, interest. Exactly. <laughs> if you're a person planning the sort of heinous act that Brenton Tarrant was planning, and he planned it for a long time, then having access to this document would have been of enormous assistance because, you know, we, we don't know often you know, just how predictable we are. Um, we, we all like to think of ourselves as, as brave individuals, but often, you know, we are very, very easy to predict. Just ask an insurance company. Um, and so we may well miss some of this stuff. But now you've got a document which says pretty much don't do any of this because someone might dob you in. Mm. So presumably, if you have got evil intent, you'll make some extra effort now not, not to braid your redhead daughters here. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, quite, quite apart from all the other aspects, I mean, I thought that was just stunning. I mean, by all means, produce a document like this for internal use, for your spooks. Um, uh, but to put it out in the public domain, I just thought... Well, what was, political was or policy process allowed this to happen, to be published? Didn't someone in the room, in government, in the SIS say, we will be lambasted and look stupid if we do this and it is a dumb idea? Because I haven't heard anyone rational or not invested by their career or their politics who hasn't said this is just silly if not, rather chilling. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's the dog in your neighbour aspect, of course, which is chilling. Um, I mean, I, I lightheartedly um, uh, headed my piece on, on the Daily Blog, um, which is still up, I think. Yeah. Um, 0800 Stasi. Because ultimately, this is where you end up. If you are encouraging citizens, first of all in the belief that there are enemies of the state all around them, um, and then you encourage them uh, to look for all these signs, and then you encourage them to call the Ministry of State Security, um, or in our case the Security Intelligence Service, um, you end up, like the German Democratic Republic, aka East Germany, um, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And as, as those decades went by, the reach of the Stasi extended further and further and further because, of course, in the 1940s and 50s, there were still real Nazis, you know, honest to goodness, um, uh, former Nazis um, all over Germany. I mean, not just uh, in the East, but in the West as well. So to say we are rooting out the Nazis and destroying the fascist remnant, I mean, there was a measure of truth to that. But by the 1980s, by the time the Berlin Wall came down, um, East Germany was just a paranoid nightmare. Yeah. You didn't know who was watching you. You didn't know who was listening to you. It could be your wife. It could be your daughter. It could be your parents. 
Uh, you had no idea. No one dared say no to the Stasi when they were asked to cooperate with the Ministry of State Security. Uh, and one word, one wrong word um, could get you fired from your job or thrown into jail. One knitting That's the sort of Well, yes, yeah. one wrong braided head of hair, right? You know, I yeah. mean, it's just... Yeah, that's the road you begin to and, and Chris, down. And I'm glad, because this, as much as we can sit there and laugh about it, and I have, it is kind of serious. In fact, it's very serious for our democracy and for our freedoms. And that's what I say. I mean, have you talked to other people? And you are of a left political persuasion. There's no doubt about that. Do other people who would hitherto be supporters of the left or supporters in general terms of, say, this Labor government, has it given other people pause for thought that something is awfully wrong here? Oh, yes, yes. I think there are more and more people, I mean, and the polls are, are slowly but surely revealing just, just how large that number is, uh, who are saying, what is it with these guys? Yeah. Where does where does this obsession come from? Now, I, you can make the case, but it seems global. I mean, the Christchurch call is embraced by liberal or yep, left wing leaders yep, in, in, yep. in advanced Western democracies. You know, all over the place. Oh, oh yes, and there's no doubt that the internet, um, social media in particular, um, is spreading all kinds of uh, lies um, yeah. across the world. Um, and that is of concern. There's mm. no doubt about that. Uh, but um, my feeling is that New Zealand got hit twice. First of all, it got hit by Brendan Tarrant mm. um, in Christchurch. And that set off a process. You had the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission came up with a whole lot of um, recommendations. So you got the move into hate speech. Uh, you got the setting up of, of uh, all kinds of, of uh, committees and councils and, and centres of excellence and goodness knows what. Um, and then you, you got hit by COVID. Yeah. And particularly with the introduction of mandates, you created, you know, a sense of uh, alienation um, from the state, a sense of mistrust. I mean, we saw that um, most dramatically uh, in Parliament grounds. And I think what also happened in relation to the parliamentary um, protest was that you got members of parliament and you've got journalists who came under the sort of pressure that in this country they simply not used to. Um, people became incredibly angry, particularly about um, vaccine mandates. They still are, and we've uh, had discussion on they, that this yeah, morning and I'm yeah, getting text on yes, that this morning. Yes, yes, and combined with the disinformation that circulates around the world in an instant um, on the internet. Uh, you've got this atmosphere in New Zealand, which was quite unusual for us. And the people who felt it most keenly were the politicians and um, the journalists who many people, rightly or wrongly, um, believe are in the pockets of the politicians. Yeah. Now, I mean, I think one of the stupidest things that this government has done, and it's done many, was, was to put money into um, the mainstream news media because in doing that, um, regardless of their reasons or how they saw their argument, to other people, it looked like the government was buying the media. Yeah. Now the media, you know, gets very indignant when whenever such suggestions are made. But as the media itself, or at least political journalists in the media, are so fond of saying, perception is everything. Well, well, no, it but that really was the reality too, Chris. Pretty. You read the conditions <laughs> under which they take the funding. Oh, I, I, I have. You yes, know, I it, have. it wasn't and just perception; that was the reality. 
they were selling editorial independence for a government handout. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the things that you had to believe, yeah. and this comes right back um, <laughs> to, the, to the subject of our discussion this morning, the things that you had to believe to access the funds. Yeah. Now, you know, w- when I read that, uh, you know, my, my, my blood ran cold because never in this country have I, uh, have I encountered something that the state released um, and r- required uh, uh, in order for you to access state funds um, along the lines of there are things you must believe before you can get this money and if it turns out that you've got the money and you don't manifest the beliefs you're supposed to have or you allow someone to contradict them, then we can take the money back. <laughs> I mean, whoa. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. This, is, this, is, this is fairly blatant stuff. Okay, so you and take now, that and you now, put it now, together with the booklet and how to dob in your neighbour. the booklet, that's right. That's right, that's right. And what it looks more and more like is a regime that has, um, you know, what we used to call um, a party line. I mean, this is, this is the line. You must believe these things. Um, if you don't believe these things, then in some strange, uh, ill-defined, um, seldom stated way, you are indeed an enemy of the people, an enemy of the state. So what's, you're a political uh, scientist, Chris. What sort of government do we call that? Uh, well... You, you call it a government heading in a very, very troublesome direction. Oh, come on. You, you know I'm going to make you put a name on it. Well, it's a totalitarian mindset. Let, let's, let's agree to that because... Um, Chris Trotter, you know, I never thought uh, I, would, I would live to look, see look, the day look, 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 where you called no, no, an no. incumbent Labor government. You said it's totalitarian. I said it it has a totalitarian mindset more and more in evidence. This country is not a totalitarian regime. Yet. You and I are talking, right, on the radio. Uh, Much to Um, the chagrin of many people, I'm sure, Chris, including the Prime Minister. Well, well, yeah, that's that's true. But, you know, um, what's that lovely line from one of Dylan's songs? It ain't dark yet, but it's getting there. Um, And... This is what I think more and more people are alarmed about. You have all these signs, you have all these weird and wonderful people cropping up with their strange ideas about braided hair and whatnot. Um, But then much more seriously, you know, you're you're watching um, television and you see the, the Minister of Justice enthusiastically confirm that there will be hate speech um legislation by the end of the year and it will be enforced before the election uh and you think ah okay she doesn't sound conciliatory at all Mm. (laughs) yeah because some some are saying oh well look you know the government's looking for national party support so whatever it is uh, it's going to be pretty pretty uh, weak beer but um Kerry Allen certainly didn't sound like she was anticipating... Well, I must admit, I talked to a senior source who said she misspoke and there was some concern in the Cabinet about what she said and she may well be forced into a correction, though I've yet to see it. Um, Mm. Chris, the other thing I guess that concerns me, though, it heartens me that someone like you is prepared to to say this, and I think there have been a number of people. The problem is those who oppose this are painted in this very partisan and binary kind of debate and, and environment that we live in as, well, anti-vax nutters or right-wingers or alt-right or fascists or Nazis or white supremacists. And I also see an opposition that, I don't know, strangely has a reluctance to jump in on these issues. I mean... You ask Chris Luxon about it, and he says, "I'm learning to Rayo." Um, do well, we yeah, need to have a? Are we in favour of, of, of free speech and learning to Rayo? Um, yeah, yeah. 
the National Party, I am, I'm, uh, the feeling I have, um, you know, watching the Nats, listening to Chris Luxon, um, mm. is that they are absolutely determined to, well, I think they've probably already won it, given get, yeah. the, the yeah. polls. Wow. But you, you think hold, it's over? To hold. Yeah. Oh, um, bar something truly spectacular, right. yes. Um, but but what the Nats do not want to lose is that comfortable um, middle-class suburban vote, right? Yeah. Um, they've got it because I think that, you know, um, middle-class suburban vote has fallen out of love with Jacinda and the Labour Party. Yeah. Has, has done that some time ago. The problem, I think, which the, their polling and their focus grouping almost certainly is throwing up to them is this. If you talk too hard line on these things, yeah. you frighten them. Yeah. Right? You frighten the horses, you frighten the suburban voter. The suburban voter doesn't like hard line. I mean, that's part of the reason they've drifted away from Labour. But they don't want a national party that sounds like Donald Trump either. But, mm. I mean, that's okay from the point of view of the Nats because they've got their sidekick, yeah. David Seymour, and ACT, yeah. who can be far more hardline yeah. and far more staunch and far more honest, I might add, yeah. um, in, in, in the uh, uh, pushing forward of their views than the National Party can. Mm. And... Yeah, as we saw in the Reed Research poll, um, the 40 plus 10 equals 50%. Uh, yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. Chris, I, I'm going to ask you a question you might not be comfortable asking, and I'm going to try and couch it in a way that gives you some wiggle room and doesn't embarrass you so much. <laughs> Can you ever remember a time when you have been less comfortable if you were to vote Labor, about voting Labor? Oh, um, unless, as I say, something very spectacular happens, I will not be voting Labor. What? Uh, for, I will not be voting Labor, and I probably won't even be voting for the Greens, which was always my, my, my out in the past, or the Alliance back in the days when the Alliance existed. Because so many people who claim to be on the left or the centre-left these days are, as you say, at best equivocal and at worst downright opposed to freedom of expression. And as a left-winger, I know, um, and as an historian, I know that the absolute bedrock of social democracy, socialism, um, that doesn't end up uh, like the Stasis um, is freedom of expression. Everything flows from freedom of expression, just as I might add in a, a much more material sense, um, everything flows from a well-housed um, nation. Mm. Um, if you don't have a well-housed nation, everything else falls to pieces because your home is the not that ties you and the rest of your community together. And if you want to know why New Zealand is in such a terrible state, it's because of the housing situation. Yeah. And, and just as people have to have a home that is secure and warm and, and, and that they can come back and, and, and feel safe in, just as you have to have that as the basis, the material basis for a decent society, you have to be free to think and speak your mind if you want a democratic society. Wow. And anybody who, does, who doesn't get that, A, ain't a leftist in my book, and B, is downright dangerous. Well, Chris, that's quite a stunning thing for you to say. For those who knew, I'm getting texts that saying it's a stunning thing to say. Just bear with me a little longer. So what does Labor do, and, and I think you've been uh, accurately brutal in your assessment, this uh, tide isn't going to be turned, the Titanic is on the, uh, uh, of this Labor government is on the iceberg. Um, it's just a question of getting to, to the lifeboats and maybe keeping the band playing for a while. What happens to the left in Labor after this election? Do they need to re-examine 
the totalitarian tendencies? Well, I think what will happen is there will be a clearing out at the top, probably voluntary, um, of uh, the, the, the three key figures in this administration, which is, of course, Jacinda Ardern, um, Grant Robertson, and, and Chris Hipkins. Now, these are the th- have, have, these three um, have really been driving Labour, uh, certainly, obviously, since uh, 2017, but even before then, um, because you you go back and you 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 look at what happened to the Labour Party in those those years when John Key was Prime Minister, and there is one and really only one consistent theme which runs through it, and that is the steady advance of those three people um, towards power. I think they will go. Um, I think, just parenthetically, they had an astonishing chance. I mean, they were young, they were well-educated, they had ideals, um, and they promised to change New Zealand, and the really important thing... To well, they are, about, just not in a way that yeah. anyone likes, Well, Chris. yes, 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 that's right. The important thing to remember is if you promise, you know, houses, if you promise uh, better education, better health, um, if you promise, you know, real uh, moves um, to deal with the, the epidemic of mental illness, there's just one thing you absolutely have to do, and that is you have to change things. And, and they've missed that opportunity. And because they've missed that opportunity, and they've only really been saved by those terrible exogenous events, um, yeah. the Christchurch mosque shootings and then the pandemic, things over which they had no control. Um, Jacinda Ardern responded to them um, superbly, at least in the early stages of the pandemic, and was rewarded for doing so. Um, but I, I really think that they will go. I think the person who will step in will be um, Michael Wood, Mm. who has spent the last two or three years really polishing his credentials. Is he the river of... That's not the river of filth, guys. That's the the guy who said that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm calling calling problematic right now, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one of the few missteps he has made, I agree. I I thought that language was exaggerated and unnecessary and unhelpful. Um, But I I will still make this prediction that the the man who will step in Mm. when um, uh, Jacinda and Grant and, and Chippy go will be Michael Wood and the party will shift its direction of travel. Um, away from the woke and more in the direction of Labour's traditional values. Um, and whether it'll take him three, six or nine years um, really will depend on him and, and how the world turns. But all is not lost for Labour. But while this this mindset is in place, while this this contempt for the democratic values of the majority of New Zealanders is an evidence. Th- these guys are dog tucker. Well, Chris, um, it has been too long between drinks having a chat with you uh, like this. Can I tell you, you are blowing up our texts and maybe the internet. <laughs> um, you are not going to be on the Labour Party's Christmas card list <laughs> this year. I, I think I think I was removed from that a very long time ago, um, Sean. I thank you so much for speaking your mind. Um, and I greatly well, and I that, greatly respect that's what and the platform's for as as far as I um, understand it, Sean, and, and thanks to you mm. um, for creating it and um, and uh, providing a place where people can still speak their minds. Thank you very much indeed. That's Chris Trotter, political commentator. Uh, My takeouts from that interview, he says this government has totalitarian tendencies 
And Chris Trotter will not vote Labour or Greens this election. He believes the election is lost for the left and largely because of the totalitarian uh, tendencies of the government. I need to process that. Um, and a lot of you are very interested in, in what he had to say. And to be honest, it makes another story breaking today. Apparently, David Farrier, the movie producer, says he's going to take legal action against me. He was saying that on some low-rating radio station somewhere else. I don't really care. Knock yourself out. I don't have any idea what you could possibly think you could take legal action against me for. I'm way more interested in um, conversations like the one we've just had uh, with uh, Chris Trotter. We are going to get that up as soon as we can, and I imagine that might trend a little. Um, stunning, stunning interview. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chris Trotter.